we have Mr. Eric Hinman. And I'm excited to share with you some of our health and fitness tips that we go over today. He also pulls back the curtain of what it looks like to be a fitness influencer. We're talking business, health, fitness, uh, and happy hustling. We're going to be diving into this episode of the Happy Hustle Podcast. Do you want blissful balance in your personal and professional life? Great. What's up, guys? My name is Kerry Jack, and I want to help you happy hustle a life you love, one full of passion, purpose, and positive impact. I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur, a professional model slash actor, a digital marketing specialist, a podcast host, author, a biohacker, an eco-warrior, a martial artist, a hippie cowboy, and a humanitarian. My goal is to educate, inspire, and entertain you to live a life of passion, purpose, and positive impact. It is time to happy hustle your dream reality. All right, Eric Hinman, my man, welcome to the Happy Hustle Podcast, brother. I am super excited to rock the mic with you. How you, how you doing, Kerry? I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, man. I'm, I'm excited to dive into the world of Eric. And, uh, you know, you got a lot going on. Specifically, you're based in Denver. You are a hybrid athlete, five-time Iron, Iron Man, which that in and of itself just makes me tired thinking about that. Uh, but very impressive serial entrepreneur and brand builder who specializes in scaling early stage consumer and wellness brands. Some of your partners include 10,000, Slate, Ice Barrel, Sisu, HVMN, the normal brand, Blokes, Masa, Chips, Kane, so much more, and Flux. Hey, man, I got a pair of Flux shoes. That's awesome. Are you are you part of them, uh, uh, founding team, or like partnership, I guess? Yeah, not part of the founding team. I was partnered with Flux for almost two years. I came out with a collab with them, the Movement is Medicine collection. Um, they're oh, great cool. guys. Uh, I'm not working with them anymore, but we had a great partnership, and uh, yeah, their shoes are awesome. Oh, super cool. Well, anyway, I mean, you have so much going on and you're really a happy hustler at your core. You know, you are mixing business with pleasure. You're you're focused on holistic well-being. And I like to highlight people like you for our tribe, our community, our happy hustlers out there. But before we get into all that good stuff on how to structure brand deals and, you know, your entrepreneurial journey and also some health and fitness tips, um, what's something interesting about Eric that not too many people know? Mm, well, right now I have a dessert that I'm eating pretty much every single night and I can share what my <laughs> dessert used to be in the Ironman years. It may not sound all that bad, but the amount of calories in it is, is definitely pretty bad. So I used to eat over a jar of almond butter every single night when I was competing in Ironman, oh, nice. burning 5,000 plus calories every single night. Uh, and now the, my go-to dessert has been... Uh, a bowl of frozen blueberries, heavy cream, and honey at night. And you mix it together, and it just has this, like, gooey, crunchy, sweet, savory uh, yeah. decadence to it. So that's uh, that's been my guilty pleasure that I've been having lately. Um, you know, I mean, I train upwards of three hours almost every single day, so I can afford Let's some extra calories in the, in the evenings. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You definitely can, man. I mean, you're absolutely shredded. And, uh, I mean, definitely an inspiration in many regards because, you know, you're no spring chicken either. You're older too. Right. I mean, if you've disclosed your age, do you mind sharing with everyone? Yeah, not at all. I just turned 44 on August 2nd. So I'm newly into 44 years old, but I, I honestly feel my best. Um, I have Leadville, the hundred mile mountain bike race coming up this weekend. And I was very bike fit, obviously to get to the Ironman world championships. I feel even more bike fit now. I mean, the wattage I'm putting out is higher than it's ever been. I weigh a little bit more than I weighed in Ironman. So I'm sure some of it is that, um, you know, leading up to the CrossFit season this year, I was the strongest I've ever been, you know, hitting PRs on, back squat, front squat, deadlifts. The only Jeez. lift that I used to be stronger at is bench press. Cause that's basically all I did when I was in college, <laughs> just after college, but yeah, yeah, all the functional lifts are, are up and yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, it's obviously slowing down and I, I don't have this incredible like fitness level where it's just year after year, like just majorly progressing, but 
you know, I stick to the same things for long enough that I continue to improve in them both fitness wise. And, you know, a lot of these things are skill too. CrossFit mm. has a lot of skill involved with it with gymnastics and Olympic lifting and mountain mm -hmm. biking. There's certainly a skill component to it. So I like picking those things where I can progress not only in fitness, but also in, in skill. Yeah, exactly, man. And I mean, I want to start with fitness since we're talking about it. What do you think people get most wrong about fitness? Like if there was one thing where you're like, this is like probably one of the most common mistakes I see, what, what would that be? I mean, I was a victim of this. I thought fitness was to perform in a sport or for an aesthetic. And mm. it wasn't until I got into Ironman that I started to make the correlation between energy levels, mental clarity, just being the best version of myself, attracting opportunities, exuding positive energy. And all of this was related to wellness. It was related to eating healthier, getting more sleep, uh, working out, lifting heavy weights, doing aerobic stuff, doing anaerobic stuff. So that, that that's the biggest misconception I see is that, you know, fitness is for a certain look or it's for just physical performance. Um, I truly believe that it is for all things to make you a better person, a better dad, a better uh, husband, a better business owner, a better employee. It just, it's made me a better person. Yeah, I, I would echo the same sentiment. Seriously, man. I mean, it's just a part of my everyday lifestyle. I do something um, kind of fun. I feel like you'd appreciate this. One of the things that is a trigger for me is every time I take a shower or a bath, um, it's a, a trigger that when I get naked, I do pull-ups, push-ups, or sit-ups. I just like max them out. So I got dong slap and push-ups. My wife always cracks up, but I haven't missed a shower in over a decade. And so I'll usually just do till I'm tired. And it's been one of my core staples. Even if I don't get a great workout, I know I got my dong slap and push-ups later and then I'll get it in. You know what I mean? So, so, um, uh, yeah push-ups, but, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, that's habit stacking, you know, it's doing yeah. something with something else. And I think habit stacking or, you know, doing things where you're maximizing your time are so beneficial. I mean, for example, I, I sauna and, and cold plunge every single night and there's a million yep. different things I could do for recovery. I could sit in Norma Tech boots. I could foam roll, I could stretch. I mean, there's a lot of things I could do that are all beneficial, but I pick sauna and cold exposure because I also feel like I get mental and emotional benefits from it. We do it every single night with friends who come over. So I get community time. That's where I get yep. most of my knowledge is from, you know, talking to other human beings. So, you know, I pick that over other things and, you know, same with, let's say mountain biking. Like there's a lot of different ways to get my heart rate up. I could just go into a indoor gym and ride a bike, but I pick mountain biking because I'm going to be outside in nature, getting sunlight, you know, there's that skill and risk-based component. So it puts me in the present moment. So, you know, mm. I feel very present afterwards. So yeah, look at everything in life is like, how can I maximize my time by doing one thing or how can I have it stack things so that I'm accomplishing multiple things at once, but they're all just kind of stacked together and I'm not thinking about it. There's no discipline. There's no motivation. It's just like, that's my structure. That's how I live my life. That's what's going to happen day in and day out. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said that habit stacking and, and it really does optimize time and time is our most precious commodity, right? Then, you know, there's, that's sure. one thing that we do not have more of it's you get what you get <laughs> and, uh, and maybe down the future, you know, uh, road will, will, will buy, be able to buy more time. But, um, unless you're Dan Martell who talks about buy back your time, he was on the podcast recently. So, you know, you, I don't know if you know, Dan, but anyway, the point is, you got it going on with your habit stacking. I think it's really important to have the happy hustlers emulate it in their own way. Um, I do want to ask you the same question, but for dieting, like, you know, really, what do you think is the most common misconception or where people really go awry when it comes to dieting? What would you say mm -hmm. that is? They make too many decisions. Again, like mm. decision making fatigue in everything, mm. you know, it, yeah. all of us face decision making fatigue. We can only make so many decisions every single day. So I try to put a lot of these things on autopilot so I'm not making decisions around them. I know every single day when I get home from the gym, I'm making my four eggs, my chicken sausage, my bowl of fruit, and I'm going to drizzle honey on it. And I'm stoked for that every <laughs> single day. I yeah. look forward to everything I eat. And then I know after my afternoon mountain bike ride, I'm making a smoothie or smoothie bowl. 
Um, it's just on autopilot. And then dinner, we're going to the butcher. We're getting a pound of meat. We're going to get some potatoes or rice. We're going to have some kind of veggie or salad. And then I'm going to snack on that bowl of blueberries at night. So it's literally <laughs> just on autopilot. And then it doesn't have to be that. Like my diet yeah. doesn't have to be your diet. Um, mm -hmm. I think the key is eating single ingredient foods that you can source from nature and figuring out what those foods are that work well for you and eating those around the same times each day. I mean, that that's worked really well for me. Some people need to snack. I, I don't really enjoy snacking. I'm an all in person. So once I start doing anything, like I'm all in on it. So once I start eating, yeah. I don't want to stop eating, um, <laughs> is exercising. I don't want to stop exercising. So I know myself and you know, that's why I've had to put diet pretty much on autopilot. The only time I will stray from that is if I'm traveling or dinner, um, breakfast and lunch, like no, non-negotiable. Like I'm having those things every single day. I very rarely go out for either of those meals, but after dinner, you know, I don't have to be as on or energized. I don't need mental clarity. I'm, I'm basically just going to bed afterwards. So, you know, that's when I'll stray from that a little bit. You know, will I have pizza occasionally? Sure. Will I have ice cream occasionally? Sure. But I wouldn't have that during the day because I know it's going to derail my day more than I want it to. Mm, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, food is thy medicine, right? The old adage. Um, I'm curious your take on intermittent fasting. I, I mean, for me, you know, I typically decrease my feeding window to eight hours, you know, um, you know, essentially lunch and dinner. I, 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 I don't like eat. Sometimes I forget to eat even like, I'm just one of those kind of guys who just, I, I, you know, I don't eat as much as I'd like. I mean, I'm a, almost 200 pounds and 195, six, one, but I'd like to be more, I'd like to be, you know, 210, just diesel, but I just don't eat enough. But I'm curious your take on intermittent fasting. What's your thoughts there? I, I think it's a habit. I think it's great because you're creating structure for yourself. Um, I mean, I essentially intermittent fast in that I'm not snacking much throughout the day. I don't really confine myself to any kind of window, but, you know, I don't keep, you know, just random things around that I can munch on throughout the day, because if I have them here, then I probably will be, you know, I will eat them, <laughs> you know, if I have <laughs> the house, I'm going to fucking eat it. So you know, <laughs> yeah. from the pantry and that, you know, I just have things that I can eat for those three square meals each day. And I mean, I have a few high protein snacks. I'll keep like chomps, meat sticks around like things mm, yeah. where again, I know they're not going to affect my energy levels. They're not, you know, calorie heavy where I'm going to feel lethargic afterwards. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think intermittent fasting works incredibly well for people. And I've never been on a, a, a long-term fast, you know, a multi-day fast, but I have a lot of friends who have and have had very positive benefits from that. Um, and if the smallest benefit you get is just some mental resilience to refrain from, you know, guilty pleasures, then that's a positive behavior. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I look at my Ironman years as these really formative years that just taught me grit and mental resilience and how to, you know, take all of these, small wins every single day and stack them to get to a place I never thought that I could get to. And, you know, it was so beneficial for me to go through that chapter. But at the same time, I'm glad I didn't get addicted to it because towards the end of that chapter, I didn't feel very good. My testosterone mm. was in the 300s. I was mm. fucking tired all the time. Um, mm. You know, I had given up so much, um, you know, relationships were lost during that time period. You know, mm. it was a very selfish time period where I took things too far. And, you know, I think that that was an important lesson for me is, you know, now like the way I train, it might look crazy to most, but I can back it up day in and day out. I look forward to every workout I do for the most part. Um, you know, I, I wake up feeling fresh. I'm not achy. I'm not sore. It doesn't hurt to go up and down stairs like it did towards the end of those Ironman years. Like I have a good balance of strength training anaerobic conditioning, aerobic conditioning. I get a lot of mobility work just from doing the Olympic lifts. And then I do recovery every single night. Um, and I feel good. And that's what's most important to me now. You know, back then I certainly had some ego involved with wanting to do well in races and get to the world championships. And now I have a lot less ego and a lot less concern about the public perception of, you know, he's an awesome athlete at this. Like, I just want to feel good every single day and I want to progress in the things I'm doing. And that's, that's good enough for me. 
Yeah, man. Amen to that. I mean, you did say one of my favorite words, which is balance. Because uh, in my mind, I believe balance equals happiness. And it really is something I see a lot of high performers do, which you mentioned is like this sacrifice everything for the goal. And for you, it was the goal of, you know, competing at the world championships of um, Ironman. For others, it might be exiting their company, you know, but what happens is oftentimes, you know, not every time, but oftentimes people will sacrifice, you know, their faith, their family, their fitness, their fun for this goal. And then they get the goal and they realize, ah, this isn't fulfilling. I don't feel joy. Uh, now I need to kind of backtrack. They call it the second mountain, climb the first mountain down and then go back up another mountain and bring everyone with you. And remember this habit stacking and these positive attributes that really will make life worth living. I'm curious for you, how do you balance your day, your, your week, thus your year, thus your life when it comes to you know, holistic happiness, both personally and professionally. Do you have a system, a framework or something that you live by? Yeah, I do. I actually just posted this recently on Instagram. Um, I labeled my definition of the hybrid athlete. And, you know, for me, it's lifting heavy weights, biking far, which I'm doing right now, preparing for Leadville, um, cultivating community, building businesses. Like those are four of my favorite things at the moment. And, you know, I've gone through enough chapters of life being 44 that I know that, you know, that might not be forever. You know, I've had various passions before that have waned and, you know, I had no passion or purpose with them anymore. And, you know, I had to give them up and then start something new that excited me. But yeah, right now, those four things really excite me. And like community is so important to me. I love mm. having people around. I love providing people with an amazing experience and, you know, back in college and just after college, that was parties. That was hosting the biggest parties. And now yeah, it's yeah. hosting the biggest like contrast therapy parties and the biggest workout, <laughs> yeah. the world's tough smile and founders only events. So yeah, I love yeah. bringing people together. I love when people get to meet others through me. I love connecting people. And I, again, I, I love leaving people with a memorable experience. And we designed our house as a wellness oasis. It's called Muscle Mountain. It looks out at the Front Range Mountains in Colorado. And I mean, we literally think, thank God my girlfriend allows this, but like every single night you'll find <laughs> five to 10 shirtless dudes just kind of running around in the backyard, going from the sauna to the gold plunge. Um, so, I mean, that's so important to me and, you know, at certain times of my life when I was either building businesses or, you know, training for Ironman, I had to give a lot of that up, um, because, you know, I had my singular focus of, I have to train five hours a day and I'm, I'm helping run this software company. And I just started a gym and I'm about to open a restaurant and, you know, I, I had all of these balls I was juggling and, you know, it took away from things that are more meaningful for me. Mm. Um, but I mean, the biggest key I've learned is that structure yields freedom. You know, my mm. days are very structured. You know, we're talking here right now at 440 Mountain Time. You know, we're going to be off this at like 515. I generally have people that start coming to the house at 515 for contrast therapy every single night. We usually start the smoker at 645 and cook meat for everybody who's who's over here. You know, my mornings, I try to get work done that I know I won't get to later in the day. So like 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. is kind of my quiet time where I'm, I'm working. Um, 8.30 to 10.30 every single day or five days a week, I'm in a CrossFit gym doing my CrossFit training, of which I follow someone's program. So, you know, I'm not going in there aimlessly. I know exactly what to do as soon as I get there. And then, hmm. I'm, you know, I have calls from 1030 until 130 every single day. And then I'm off in the mountains, mountain biking after that. And then I do calls and meetings again from like three until five or 515. Um, and my, my girlfriend, Sarah, my dog, they're involved in a lot of the day. She works here at, at uh, from the house. She runs events for Ice Barrel and she's a chiropractor. So oh, cool. She sees oh, nice. And she enjoys a lot of the same things I enjoy, the contrast therapy, and she goes to her yeah. Pilates class, and we both love entertaining and drilling together. So we've kind of designed this life where, you know, we have the people in it that we want in it, and we've both been able to figure out how to monetize portions of that life that we love living. But, you know, ultimately, um, I'm done trading time for money. Like, I want to... Mm. 
I want to live my life in a way where I just feel fulfilled at the end of every single day. And obviously we need money to live in this world. You know, I'm going to figure out ways to monetize that, but I'm not going to, you know, go and do something that I don't enjoy doing, you know, just to, to make some more money. And I've said no to a lot of monetary opportunities because I recognized they were going to take away from my time that I enjoy spending with Sarah and, and Blaze or the time I enjoy spending at the gym or the contrast therapy time. Or you know, that's why I haven't started another business since 2000. 17 is like i enjoy my freedom right now to mm. you know just document my life and you know work with brands that i really want to work with yeah bro oh i mean you crushed it with um you know putting freedom at the forefront we talk about the three freedoms in, inside the happy hustle creative freedom time freedom and financial freedom right mm -hmm. and and those are the three freedoms i know you crave and have and 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 similarly me and it's really i think what everyone wants and it's designing your lifestyle intentionally uh fun fact my mom's a chiropractor too so i grew up as a chiro oh. baby and technically the first chiropractic uh adjustment ever in the entire history of human uh, humanity because i was connected to the umbilical cord and she adjusted me so beat that so cool. uh you can't beat it um <laughs> unless you do it inside the womb which i guess you can right um which she did as well but anyway i was raised super holistic and you know very natural no antibiotics no vaccines none of that stuff and so yeah. I, I just believe in that type of lifestyle and also integrating again this you know people talk about work-life balance it gets a bad rap i believe you know in what we call the systematic harmonization of ambition and well-being that's the definition of happy hustling and you've been able to do that phenomenally well and that's why i wanted to highlight you and even you know go down this rabbit hole with you if you're cool i'd like to explore some of these monetization verticals that you've been able to create talk to us a little bit about your business model and, and structure currently sure i mean it's evolved over the years i I've really fallen into this world of influencer marketing, content creation. There was never any intention when I started my Instagram account back in 2010 that, you know, I was going to be working with brands and creating content for them. You know, it's just like most people when they start their Instagram account, at least back then, like you're sharing pictures for your friends to see and you're sharing your mm -hmm. life. And, you know, it's grown into a, a brand and now a business from doing that consistently for 15 years. And I mean, now they're, they're more consulting agreements. It certainly started out very much as like a sponsored athlete where during my Ironman years, you know, I had a bike sponsor and you know, I had a couple apparel companies that would send me apparel, but you know, it was nothing that was paying the bills back then. I had other businesses that I was running that were paying the bills. And then in like 2015, 16, um, I started getting paid to post pictures for brands that I loved wearing their stuff or using their stuff. Oakley was one of those brands where in 2016, they invited me to spectate the Ironman World Championships and promote their new sunglasses they were coming out with. It's a brand I always loved and I wore their sunglasses when I was competing in Ironman. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds amazing. But that yeah. was also my aha moment of wow, like marketing dollars are going to get shifted from TV and radio to social media. And that's even going to be pulled away from like Google ads and it's going to go towards niche influencers. So 2016 was kind of my pivotal moment of, I'm like, okay, I need to learn photography. I need to get a nice camera. I need to understand how to take a good picture. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Apologies for interrupting your programming. But I have to tell you, the best investment you can make in yourself is one in which helps you acquire skills. You've probably heard people talk about, oh, just invest in yourself and you'll be successful. Yes, that's true to a degree, but you have to invest in skills that will ultimately help you achieve your desired results. And I think one of the best skills one can possess, be it an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, is the sales sword really knowing how to sell, utilizing pressure-free persuasion, which will make you more money and more impact. Now, if you wanna know how to sell more efficiently and effectively, I just launched a sales course called The Proven Roadmap Process to Selling Millions of Dollars and Helping You to Increase Your Conversions, guaranteed. And you can get access to this new sales course that the Happy Hustle is launching at thehappyhustle.com forward slash sales. 
And if you act fast, you'll get it at the lowest price it'll ever be available because we are launching it and we want to gain amazing testimonials and social proof to further share this knowledge. So if you act fast, you can get it at the lowest price it'll ever be. That's at thehappyhustle.com forward slash sales. Now let's get back to this episode. And also like I want to add value. I want to inspire people. I want to share you know, how I've balanced triathlon with building businesses, how I got to where I got in triathlon, um, how I maintain muscle mass while still competing in triathlon. So I just started sharing these different themes that, you know, I, I realized that people really resonated with. And the last four years, it's turned into much more of a consulting agreement with all of the brands I work with. Um, half of the brands I work with, I'm an investor in, so I'm on the cap table. So I literally put mm. my money where my mouth is. Um, I raise money for brands. So I raise SPVs for some of the brands that I work with. If what number SPVs? Um, right. SPV is just an investment vehicle to allow okay. accredited investors to invest in a, in a private company. Um, so I'll do that for brands. Um, I have a pretty large product seating list. I've met tons of amazing people through the years, hitting hard workouts with them, doing Ironmans, jumping in cold streams, sitting in hot saunas. So I have this list of influential people in the wellness space that I send product to when I'm working with, with brands. Um, and then I host a ton of community events, uh, community cold plunges, workouts, the world's toughest mile, founders only events where I curate them with 30 founders of wellness brands and just allow them to interact with each other and you know share what's working and not working. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm just making a lot of connections behind the scenes. I've amassed, you know, a big network of, of people in the wellness space, uh, you know, people that make decisions at large retailers, people that run the largest wellness events in the world. So I'm just making a lot of connections, you know, helping build these brands. And I like working with early stage companies because I know that's where I can add the most value. That's where I have the most experience. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've also befriended a lot of other influential people in the wellness space where I can be like, yeah, Carrie moves the needle for this brand, this brand, and this brand. I think he would be mm. really good product uh, market fit for you. His audience is really engaged with recovery from running. You know, you'd be a great fit for them. And I make that match. So that, mm. that's a lot of what I'm doing behind the scenes. And then obviously, you know, what I'm doing that everyone can see is creating content on my social media page um, to raise awareness for brands and then allowing brands to whitelist that content, which is them sponsoring content through my name, using my name, image, and likeness. Mm, yeah. Love it, man. Very diverse and robust. And I think with a personal brand, you almost have to be, you know, thinking different verticals and, and different revenue streams. I know you mentioned this, um, vast network and, the connections between very influential people. I do this often as well. And I've heard uh, David Meltzler talk about an overlap agreement. And what he does is he gets 10% of any you know overlap that he um, creates from a connection. Do you have anything in place of that nature? I don't know. I mean, you know, the brands are paying me. That's part of my deliverable to them. And you know, ultimately, like these are friends. I want everyone to benefit. Yeah. I want the brand to get larger. I want my friends to benefit. I want, you know, ketone yeah. IQ carried in Wegman. So, I mean, they're just, yeah. I consider it a win-win. And again, I'm yeah. not looking to be greedy anymore. I don't need more money to be happy. I've, I've made enough residual income in my insurance business that I can essentially live off that. So anything on top of it is just money that I'm either using to invest or money that I'm essentially giving back by just hosting people every single night and feeding <laughs> a, a ton of hungry men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. That's, you know, the giver mindset. It's beautiful. I uh, appreciate that. One of our 10 alignments of being a happy hustler, our soul mapping system, the S in soul mapping. I wrote a whole book about it. I can send it to you if you want to read it. But uh, S is selfless service. And I think without that, it's difficult to really you know, have that true fulfillment. And I don't have like an overlap agreement either in place, but I was always just curious with someone of your nature who is making a ton of connections. And, you know, I think uh, creating so many amazing, valuable, you know, moments for others. Um, so it comes back. Though. I mean, it, it really does. Comes back. I, I truly believe 
you know, in a, a non, non-foo-foo way that like the universe reciprocates. If you put value too. out yeah. there, you're kind to people, like it comes back to you. And again, I've been doing this long enough to have seen it come back to me. So I know if yeah. I continue to live my life the way I do, that opportunities are going to present themselves. And, you know, just by like you doing this podcast, you are occupying this small fragment of a lot of people's minds. So, you know, when an opportunity comes their way and, you know, like you're going to be one of the people on their mind to, to, you know, connect that opportunity with. So, you know, that's happened enough times for me that I'm just like, okay, I'm just, I want to do good in this world. I want to add, you know, value for lots of people. Yep. And it's, it's going to come back to me some way or another. Yeah. Yeah. My, my buddy, uh, Garrett Gunderson, I don't know if you know him, but I'm happy to make a connection. If you want to know him, he's a great dude. Um, uh, he talks about being a value creator, like Mm -hmm. being a value creator is just the best way to live life. And, um, yeah, you, you've essentially done that. Uh, I'm curious, let, let's kind of get into it a little bit deeper, best investment you've ever made not like just in yourself, because I know that's definitely part of it, but I'm talking like a specific brand. And if you can kind of break down the deal flow or structure or terms of what that would look like. So then someone out there maybe listening could be like, hey, I know of a cool company that I'm potentially interested in. I see potential. Here's how Eric structured it. Anything uh, come to mind in that realm? Yeah, a few things. I'm not going to answer it uh, exactly the way you first want me to answer it, but I would say the (laughs) best investment I made was building residual income and an asset right out of college. I started an insurance agency. My father gave me that opportunity early on to Hmm. sell insurance policies through the insurance company that he was the CEO of. And, you know, over a seven year period, I built up a nice book of residual income business that I still own today. And ironically, my dad has run that business for me now for the last five years. Um, so I mean, that's, that's the best investment I made where every single year I have residual income coming in that I have very little for anymore. So that's the best investment I've ever made. Um, other great investments I've made, I bought Tesla when it IPO'd. I had, Oh, nice. Me too. When it first came out back in 2012. So, I mean, that, that obviously was an incredible investment with how far, uh, how far Elon's grown, grown that company. Mm-hmm. I've sold it along the way. I certainly didn't hang on to all of it. I was, you know, it went from 30 to 300 and I'm like, how could it go any higher? And then it went to, like, <laughs> yeah. but you know, that was a great investment as far as private brands. I mean, I invested in the angel round, uh, or I'm sorry, seed round of 10,000 back in 2016 when they had mm. one pair of shorts with a white X on them. I think they had maybe a yeah. hundred back then, but I really liked Keith, the entrepreneur. Um, I liked the connections that he had. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot over the years of investing in these companies to, to know more and more of what to look for, for it to be a successful outcome for all parties. Mm. Like yeah. also like, you know, you, you don't want to just give money to a company. It's nice to add more value. And that's why I invest in the private companies I invest in where I know I can make really valuable introductions or I can build awareness through, through my brand that'll help grow their brand. So I tend to invest in companies now where, you know, there's a lot more value I can add beyond just the the money I'm putting in. Uh, But generally I'm investing in either a seed round or a series A round. So pretty early in the company. And another one that I just invested in that's doing really, really well is try create creatine gummies. And mm. I mean, now I'm looking at customer acquisition costs, long-term value of the, of the, their customers. Um, what's their growth look like? How fast are they growing? Um, who are possible um, acquirers? Does the founder have connections to those possible acquirers? Like Unilever just invested in the series A round for try mm. create. Unilever buys companies in this space. So, oh, that's a great way for all of us to get our money back because, you know, these companies are not paying dividends or, you know, you're not getting any kind of money at the end of the year. Generally, they have to either go public or they have to sell to another company or sell the private equity to get a return on it. So, you know, now I look at that as like how who could possibly acquire them and why would one of these larger companies want to acquire them? Yeah, man, it's uh it's very interesting to hear the progression of how you now use discernment to invest in companies. And you are so well versed now in, in the entire ecosystem of, you know, early stage startup all the way to acquisition. And, uh, it's super cool. I'm sure you have like a, 
a whole you know list of criteria for companies that you do play ball with um more kind of broad strokes speaking what like there's there's a ton of entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs out there who have personal brands who follow the show and you know maybe they're looking to land like their first influencer deal right or you know partnership deal one thing that i like to do is hybrid deals where i'll uh you know i'll take a retainer up front for x amount of deliverables maybe it's podcast ads or social media content or email list drops and then after we get x amount back whatever that initial retainer money was for the month then it turns into an affiliate you know 30 percent call it uh on the back end so this is hybrid play of sponsorship and affiliate nature and it's worked well in our business because the brands know we're invested in not just the bare minimum, you know, mm -hmm. which oftentimes happens as an influencer. You're like, I just got to do one post and then you only do one post. So mm -hmm. we're incentivized on the back end because we get a rev share, you know, mm -hmm. of, of gross. Any um, tips for, you know, aspiring, you know, brand partnerships or influencers out there um, that you could shed light on? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the biggest key is product market fit. Um, you know, Andrew Huberman, obviously massive following, very influential in the wellness space. You know, would he have good product market fit for um, candy? Obviously not. You know, would he have good product <laughs> yeah. fit for maybe fashion? You know, probably not. Even though he has a big <laughs> audience and, you know, he is very influential. But like product market fit is the key to this. So, you know, someone who reviews cold exposure units on YouTube like a cold exposure company should be all over that. That That is product market fit. That's what that person is known for. That's where they're mm -hmm. going to massively move the needle. And, you know, maybe they have a million followers, but they might not have any reach in fashion. They might not have any reach in beauty. So the key is finding people, you know, who love your, your product or they're like product reviewers in that space. And, you know, their audience is looking to them for, you know, advice and content within that realm. I mean, all of these platforms are moving more and more towards engaging content and they're moving away from just a large following and, and large reach. So mm. it, it honestly is like massively leveling the playing field for, you know, the, the mommy blogger who has 1400 followers on Instagram. If she creates amazing content, she could get more views on her stuff than if I post something that just isn't engaging and, you know, is shitty content. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's cool that that's the way it's moving because now no longer can Kellogg's, you know, just pay to have, reach like yeah the, the these platforms are incentivizing content that the audience really likes so yeah. that's the other piece is like you know create something that is really engaging and the more narrow you can be the better i mean my friends who have the largest followings they, they post basically the same things every single day they're posting you know about high protein recipes that's all they do every single post is a high protein recipe and they crush it because their audience knows exactly what they're getting. And there's mm. plenty of brands out there that probably would want to move their products through them. There's lots of high protein products out there. Um, so yeah, like go narrow and deep on a certain niche, be a thought leader, and then build a brand around it, build something, you know, super, super narrow so that you are just completely known for, for something. Mm, yeah. I mean, sage words, man, truly. I hope everyone out there, all the happy hustlers, go narrow and deep. As my friend uh, John Lee Dumas says, it, you know, most people, they go a mile wide and an inch deep. You want to go a yeah. mile deep and an inch wide. Um, 100%. And it's so awesome much easier stuff. said than done. I mean, I fall into this yeah. too. Like, Me I have too. I like post and, <laughs> yeah. you know, but yeah, again, the ones who I see doing it the best, they're very narrow with their with their content and they know exactly what their audience wants from them. Yeah. Yeah, man, for sure. I, I'm just curious. Um, you know, I just had, I didn't have my wife did my, my first child, a son, a little baby boy, his name's Kaizen, 10 month old. Thank you, man. Hey. Um, do you want kids? Do you have kids? What's your status there? No, no kids. My, uh, our dog blaze is laying here right now. She actually has uh, oh, the, blaze. The, the rock tape on her back right now. Cause she went to the chiropractor yesterday. Oh, nice. Sorry. What kind of dog? Um, she's a pit bull mix. She's oh, 11. Cool. Still in, oh, we had a pit bull house. too. Yeah. Yeah. Great dog. But yeah, no oh, kids yeah. right now. And, 
you know, I'd, I'd never say never, but it just, it, it never clicked for me. I a hundred percent, you know, as I've gotten older, I get the appeal of it, but it just, it, it never, it never clicked for me. And same for my girlfriend, Sarah, you know, it just never really clicked for her where, um, she was like, yeah, I definitely want to have kids by this age. And I grew up as an only child and my parents mm -hmm. never put pressure on me to, you know, have a, a family. So I think some of that was just kind of instilled from growing up, you know, in a small family. And I always surrounded myself with like tons of friends and, you know, that's why having community and friends here all the time is so important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. I mean, and, and I, I mean, I got friends in the same boat or just, you know, I'm good just living in my life. And I'll tell you what, uh, kids will change things. It's definitely, uh, yeah. the most challenging thing I've ever done, but also the most beautiful blessing that I've ever, um, had. So I'll leave it at that. Um, this has been amazing, Eric. I want to respect your time, bro. If it's cool with you, I'm going to put you through the happy hustle rapid fire round, and then we'll wrap this interview up. Um, this is really just where I ask you random things and you answer, honestly, first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Favorite food. Go. Steak. Nice. Favorite movie? God, I watch very few movies. Um, <laughs> this is going back a while, but I used to watch Gladiator almost every single weekend nice. back in, uh, in college. So Gladiator is <laughs> probably one of my favorite movies. Heck yeah, great movie. Favorite book? Uh, How to Win Friends and in Influence People. was def Dale Carnegie was one of the more transformative books I've read. Yeah, great read. What's your spirit animal? Ooh, um, cheetah. What? Yeah. That's me too, man. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Um, happy hustle hack for your health. Something that we haven't mentioned. Something uniquely Eric that you do. Um, hmm. I am standing right now and I stand pretty much at all times throughout the day. I have three standing desks. I have one inside, two outside. I'm, I'm generally honestly working outside, but it's raining out right now. Um, so yeah, standing, not, not sitting very often that, I mean, for how much I train, it has allowed me not to get sore, stiff and ache. Love it. Happy hustle hack for your money. Maybe something you do to save, invest or spend wisely. Um, outsource it. That's, uh, you know, if I have money in the market and I'm day trading it, I am so emotionally invested in it. If I, <laughs> if I win, like I certainly get like a little bit of a boost, but if I lose, it fucking ruins my day. So <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, I decided several years ago to outsource all money management and have someone else like investing, paying the bills. Like I don't, I don't even look at it. <laughs> Fair enough. I like it. And and a happy hustle hack for your spirituality. You know, I don't necessarily, um, I'm spiritual, not religious, I believe, you know, but having a higher power really is a, a piece of uh, the puzzle when it comes to fulfillment. Do you have a happy hustle hack to connect, connect to a higher power, something you do? Uh, yeah, get outside in nature every single day. I mean, I call that my moving meditation. Those Iron yeah. Man years were um, where I recognized that I was just going through the motions of life and I wasn't really mm. living with passion and purpose. I was just kind of conforming to what society told me to do to be successful. And just by sp spending time alone in nature with my heart rate elevated, you know, I consider that my four year psychedelic experience without having to do any psychedelics. Like I was <laughs> able to just really like open up, uh, of how I wanted to live, live my life and, you know, how, how I could be fulfilled every, every single day. So yeah, get outside in nature. I think it's so important beyond just getting some sunlight and getting exercise. Yeah. Amen to that, man. All right. Bringing it home with three things you're most grateful for today. Uh, girlfriend, Sarah, um, just how loving she is and how she just allows me to be exactly who I am and, I don't ever feel like I have to be someone else. Uh, my health, certainly, you know, I mountain bike today for two and a half hours. I rode up 4,000 feet from an elevation Dang. of 8,500 to 12,500. Jeez and, Louise. You know, it honestly was, it's, it's, it's normal to do that, which is crazy to think. Uh, and then three would be, I have so many amazing friends in my life. I, just celebrated my birthday. Like I was telling you and yeah, happy belated. Had, uh, thank you. I had 12, 12 friends who joined me on this 
36 mile, fairly technical point to point mountain bike <laughs> ride up in uh, Salida, Colorado. And I'm just so grateful to have so many like amazing like-minded friends around me. I have about 15 friends who are doing Leadville this year and it's like normal for like someone in my circle to be doing the Leadville 100 race now. Like, it, you know, someone tells me that 15 years ago, I'd be like, what? You're, you're running a hundred miles at 12,000 feet of elevation and you're going to do it in under 20 hours. And now it's just so normalized because my friend group is so awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's literally one of the toughest races in the world, is it not? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, <laughs> in the ultra running world, like an ultra runner probably would argue that there's harder races, but yeah, I mean, it's a fucking yeah. hard race. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Running I mean, miles is you. hard. <laughs> I know just running, you know, 10 miles is, I mean, let's be honest, yeah. that's, that's beast mode, hundred miles, 12,000 feet of vision, man. All right. I got to ask if you had a billboard for the world to see with your last piece of content on there, what does that billboard read, Eric? Movement is medicine. Mm, crushed it man you crushed that rapid fire round and listen man i just want to take a moment to acknowledge you for sharing your love your light your wisdom your health and fitness tips and tools and tactics and and also pulling back the curtain on your monetization strategy it's it's really an inspiration how you've been able to i i really see you as this person who has been able to m m blend work and, you know, uh, per personally and professionally, this this harmonization in a very successful manner. And, um, yeah, kudos to you. I appreciate, you know, you taking the time and collaborating and looking forward to having you out in Montana one of these days soon and uh, maybe taking you in the woods with us. Uh, but thank you. I just want to say that. Yeah, I appreciate you. And I will 100 percent take you up on that invite. I've not been to three states, Montana, Idaho and ah, North Dakota. Let's go. So high up on yeah. the list to get. All right, man. Well, um, I do want to give you an opportunity to uh, kind of mention some links. Where's the best place for people to connect with you, to learn more about you, to follow you online? I know you have, you know, millions of followers and views and, you know, all sorts of brands that you work with. Where, where's the best place for people to learn more about Eric? Yeah, Instagram is the best place, which is just my name, Eric Hinman. Um, on TikTok, YouTube, website, erichinman.com. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and we'll link that up in the show notes, um, erichinman.com. Tie a bow on everything we talked about today. If you can, give everyone out there, you know, uh, a call to action, will you? You know, maybe something regarding health and fitness, maybe something regarding business. It's up to you, wherever you want to take it, but tie a bow on it for us if you could. Yeah, I think it's just living more mindfully, um, recognizing whether you're just going through the motions of life or if you're really living a life on offense that's defined, you know, by what fulfills you. And um, yeah, just it's crazy compounding consistencies over time, how much they can stack up in one direction or the other. You know, if you're just kind of going through the motions of life, then where you are 10 years from now is vastly different than, you know, if you're actually living your life in a way you want to live it day in and day out, they take you to two very different places. So just taking a step back and, you know, recognizing whether or not you're living a life of, of intention. Well said, man. All right. Final question, Eric, what does happy hustling mean to you? A happy hustling. I mean, progress is what it means for me and doing it in a way where you enjoy it. So much of my life is based around progress, whether, you know, it's helping others build businesses, me building, um, you know, a business consulting, you know, my mountain biking, CrossFit, like every day I'm just hustling, but in a way that I enjoy it. I'm not just like grinding it out, stressed out, you know, I'm doing things I enjoy each day, but you know, the hustle is what keeps me going. And it's what, what I really thrive on is, is progress in all aspects of life. Well said brother, mic drop, Eric Hinman, y'all. Thank you for watching and listening. We are out. Peace and love everyone.